In Acts 12 and verse 24, but the word of God grew and multiplied. Well, that didn't mean there was more and more revelation from God. It meant that people were being influenced by it more and more. Well, of course, that means that they had to want to be influenced by it. They had to want to understand it. They had to see the need in their lives of knowing it and all such things as that. You can read the first recorded gospel sermon and the responses to it, and you see those people really desiring to know what was right and do what was right. And they did. At least 3,000 were added to the Lord's church on that day. Now, the thing about it is that those people of that time did this through all kinds of trials and tribulations and duress and animosity and some didn't care, even as many do not care today about spiritual things. But I think we can say that the establishment of the Lord's church and its spread in the early part of the first century is one of the most marvelous and striking stories in the history of the world. And the question I always raise for my own good, trying to be a gospel preacher all these years, is how was this accomplished? How was this accomplished? Now let me pause and say I recognize that at times people are more disposed to hear the gospel, more interested in spiritual things. And I don't know what it takes in a culture, in a society, economically and so forth, to jar people to the core of their being to cause them not to put their trust in material things. But I know enough about history to see that pendulum swing back and forth at times in the past. There have been folks who didn't care if things were about the truth. And yet things would come upon them that would say, this flesh and this world has nothing to offer you, and they would begin to look otherwise. We'll note that it was done, the preaching of the gospel, the winning of souls, without a single tool that we claim we must have to be successful in carrying the gospel to people today. I think that's highly significant. There wasn't any printed page as we know it. There was print, but it was copied by hand. There was no radio, there was no television, there were no newspapers, of course, or anything like that. It was even difficult sometimes to write a letter to somebody. Uh, there were announcements made and things of that nature, but as far as any great publications, as far as the populace was concerned, uh, there wasn't much of a way to get things out the way we disseminate news or we've known of it being disseminated. Of course, there was no kind of internet, anything like that, no telephones, no electronic services. And yet, by the time you read the letter Paul wrote to the Colossians, he says that everybody had had an opportunity to hear the gospel of Christ. Doesn't mean that one person had stood before every individual and taught them the Bible. It means that as the church went into all the world to preach the gospel, that everybody had had the opportunity to hear the gospel if they'd wanted to. It had been made available to them. And that is made very clear in the first chapter of the Colossian epistle. It's also interesting to note that as you read about the church being established, that there was trouble in the church. Even while the New Testament was written, there were churches with problems. I'll just select the one most of us know if you're familiar with the New Testament, and that's the 1 Corinthian epistle addressing problems in that particular church. And then we learn something about ourselves, about how God has ordained and controlled providentially of the world and the church. He says plainly that there must be, in 1 Corinthians 11, 19, heresies among you. Now why? That they which are approved may be made manifest. In other words, false teachers in the church try those who are faithful. It shows who will stand for the truth, who will not. Is the doctrine of Christ important to a person? If it's not, then anything goes. But that's what the Holy Spirit had Paul write to the church at Corinth regarding the problems right there. Because he's saying these problems are going on within that church. 
to make it very well known who stands for the truth and who doesn't, who loves the truth and who doesn't. Now, what is it that we think we need today if we give that much thought to these things about the growth of the church? And I say growth here meaning uh, in number. Well, I guess the first thing is we've got to have a good preacher with an educational background. Well, of course, a person has to know the Bible and know it correctly, or he can't teach what he doesn't know. But the point is, is that God intended, according to watch it, to everybody's several ability. And that changes among us. In the church, to be able to teach the truth to others and be interested in taking the truth to others. You know, when you get interested in trying to teach others, to be able to teach others, you're going to prepare yourself according to your ability to learn to be capable of teaching others. And we're all at different uh, degrees of knowledge, ability, and experience. But one of the things that's interesting about the body of Christ, and the members in particular, is that if you don't feel qualified or you know you're not qualified to deal with a certain matter, there's somebody somewhere that's a brother in Christ or is a sister in Christ who can. That's one of the aspects of fellowship I don't know that we Christians really appreciate, is to be able to draw from one another what we cannot supply sometimes on our own and for ourselves. Also, if we don't watch out, we will adopt the view of the denominations that you have a clergy system and where the preacher is the primary one to teach the gospel. But I don't know where we learn that from the Bible that one can be supported full-time to teach the gospel, edifying the church and getting it out to the lost, that's true, no doubt about it. But because it's so much akin, with usually one, two preachers in a congregation, that it sort of gets over into the pastor concept of the denominations. And that's his job. Sort of reminds me of parents today. Well, we're not expected to teach our children when God says it is your responsibility to teach your children, we'll just leave it up to the public schools. Well, the church can kind of get that idea because of the pastor-clergy system out in the denominations that uh, the way they operate, it rubs off on us. And we think, well, it's the preacher's job. I've known of preachers who were fired because they weren't reaching enough people. Well, it may be that that preacher wasn't doing all he was expected to do. But then again, what were the other people doing in the church? They don't feel an obligation to where they are to try to reach people with the gospel. There's something wrong with all of us if we don't have that obligation in our mind toward God with all the lost people around us not to do something to try to open their eyes to the gospel. It's God's power to save, and they can't be saved without it. We think we have to have a relatively nice building in a fine location. This is the American mind, mind you. If you go in various other parts of the world, and it's brought home to us now by the Internet, you can see what some of our brethren in Africa or Indonesia or the Philippines uh, meet in, the kind of houses they meet in. And I don't know that we would even consider them much more than storage houses for junk. That's the way it is, but that's their place. That's the best they can do. They're saved by the same gospel we are, and they live by the same truth of the New Testament, and they worship the same way. I remember in Indonesia going out into villages to where they had relatively good houses. By that, don't compare to what we have. They're not good compared to what we have. And the windows were open. There were no glass or anything like that. They're just windows and on the equator down there when it gets six o'clock the sun goes down like a rock it does it every day there's no gradual setting of anything it's just gone so there's no electricity out there when we would drive several hours out in those villages we couldn't meet at night so we had to go out and meet at about four o'clock in the afternoon and everything be through within an hour or so so we could drive back to where it was we were staying because there was no electricity it's going to be black as pitch well, that was the best those people had, and they were serving God as well as any of us, maybe better. But if we don't watch out, we let our culture and our society 
cause us to have a view of what we think we need to spread the gospel. We think we have to be acceptable in town, or at least the neighbors round about us. I realize in a bigger city atmosphere like Houston, that's not the same as in smaller towns, but nevertheless, that mentality can creep in up on us. Then, too, we have to have freedom of religion. Well, does that mean you don't appreciate the Constitution giving us freedom of religion? Not at all. I'm thankful for it. But you don't have to have freedom of religion for the church to be established and for people to be reached with the gospel and for the church to discharge its obligation teaching it. When you read the book of Acts, if you had asked Paul, what kind of freedom of religion do you have? Well, when he was Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor, the Christians at that time didn't feel like when he was after them they had any freedom of religion. It wasn't done that way. And for most of the world's history since the church was set up, it hasn't been here. Yes, let's pray for it and let's do what we can in our society and the way it's been set up. But if it all disappeared, it would not stop the obligation laid upon us as the spiritual body of Christ and members in particular to spread the gospel. We think we have to have a nation at peace. I don't know really what at peace means except that we're not in a world war uh, like it was in World War II. Because uh, all over this country, there's something up in the air that would not be called peaceful. But I think that's what we mean. Well, since when? Read Acts. Believe Acts. Know it's inspired of God and inspired history. And notice what a mess those people were in wherever they went, specifically taking the gospel. We think we have to have good weather. It's amazing just look around about us right here. It's amazing what can keep us away from here that cannot keep us away from Walmarts. Think about it. Or it can't keep us really from any place we really want to be. And yet those things sink into where we would not articulate it that way in the words as I'm speaking now, but they impact us. They cause us to think that way. And we make decisions accordingly. It has to be the right time of the year. Well, I'm not saying these things don't have a bearing. But I'm saying we need not think everything has to be absolutely perfect temperature-wise before we can spread the gospel to people. I have been in places to where it was extremely hot. I've often said if you want to go to the Southeast Asia, just work hard in the summer in Houston. You get as good a preparation for going to Southeast Asia as you can used to say over in Singapore that it's hot. It's terribly hot, and then I can't stand anymore. <laughs> it can get awful hot. Well, I've had the same feeling around here sometimes doing things, but people get out and do it anyway, don't they? What about souls who are lost in sin? Now, I'm not talking about the fact that people won't study with you no matter how many times you try, but how many times do we try? So we need to understand that the right time of the year, by the way, the right time of the year in Russia when I went over there to Murmansk, the largest city above the Arctic Circle, was in February and in, in January. The only reason we went in February is that uh, the night, the 24-hour uh, day darkness was over with in February. So there was pretty good daylight by 9 o'clock and still daylight by 4 o'clock, sort of dim in between. But the point is that's when the people were there. If you waited until the summer, they all left up there and went back down south. So if you're going to evangelize there, it was wintertime with snow up to your eyebrows. But that was the time to go. So different uh, situations demand different times to do it. We talk about good prospects. Now, I want you to think about that. When you say, well, so-and-so is a good prospect, what have we got in our mind that is a standard to determine whether so-and-so is a good prospect? That is, we think they're open to study the Bible with it. What is a good prospect? How do you determine that? Go through the book of Acts and look at those cases of conversion as the church went out preaching the gospel. Would you have thought that the Ethiopian eunuch, a man of high rank and a treasurer to Queen Candace, that he had had any interest whatsoever in the truth? What about that pagan jailer in Philippi? Was that a good prospect? Would you measure him as a good prospect to take the gospel to? 
and on and on you can go. Some of the very people we don't want much to be around are people, remember Christ died for everybody. Christ shed his blood for these bums around here, just whatever. That doesn't mean we're going to be able to set up Bible studies with them, but it means we should not say in our minds and create a mindset that says, well, what good would it do to mention it to them? So everything has to be convenient because we live in a society of convenience. We live in a society that, uh, you know, if you don't have padded pews and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, I'll let that stand for all the conveniences. Well, we can't do it. Well, I, I'm pleased with padded pews. I'm pleased with air conditioning. Anybody living in Houston is not pleased with air conditioning. There's something wrong with them. Because, in fact, in the South, there'd be a whole lot of businesses that wouldn't even be conducted if it wasn't for air conditioning. Can you imagine Houston without air conditioning from now until next November? No, you can't. So all of that's important. I'm not putting that down at all. But let's don't fall into the devil's trap of saying, unless it's just real easy and everything's set up just so-so, um, I can't do it. That's what I'm talking about. Our young people have everything in the world done for them in the homes and out of the homes. We all want to help our young people every way we can. If we'll remember, and it wasn't too long ago for some of us, we were, we were young people. We enjoyed things that young people enjoyed. But there's probably been in the last 50 years uh, children camped and rallied and catered to and every way under the sun, and, and not a bad thing. I don't mean that. But I'm saying that what do children know? In fact, what do many adults know of privation and hardship today? Coming from parents that were reared during the Depression and went through World War II, I assure you what I grew up with and what my children grew up with and now my grandchildren and starting in on great-grandchildren, we know nothing about what they went through. But it could happen again, couldn't it? Well, what's the church going to do in all this? What's the Bible going to be in all of this? What is it to us? And then the souls of men. Remember, somebody loved us enough to prepare themselves to teach us the gospel, to make themselves available and were concerned about our souls. We might do well sometimes to help us be stronger in the faith, to sit down and say, uh, just really recount all the things that's been done for me by others that help me learn my Bible and see the importance of my soul and how to use life in seeking first the kingdom of God my, and, and His righteousness. That's so important. But these are things that can just slip in on us. I think um, as long as our society to stay, is, stay the way it is, we're going to have to remind ourselves of that or else we get to a point where, well, it's just got to be so-so or we can't do it. What did the first century... Uh, offer well if you take formal education now notice I say formal education uh, the preachers really were mediocre in that there were a few of them like the Apostle Paul uh, granted the Apostles were inspired of the Holy Spirit to infallibly give us by the power of the Spirit the New Testament so that it wouldn't be contaminated by the fallibilities of men but when it comes to formal education it, uh, it just wasn't there. I Many people didn't read. There were those who did. One of the things about the letters that were written to churches where they would be read to the congregation because some people out there couldn't understand or could not read, I should say. They could not read it themselves. And if you follow through with reading in the churches all the way up into the Protestant Reformation, when the Bible was freed from Roman Catholicism, made available the language of, of Europe, and especially English, the translators of the King James Version translated it with the idea that it would be read publicly, and so they punctuated it as if it would read well publicly, because they had lengthy readings of the Bible to the people in the churches. And we don't hardly read much at all anymore. Uh, even it was at least thought by some, according to Paul's 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 10, that Paul's speech was contemptible. What all that meant, uh, I don't know. That's what they thought. Our educational requirements would have eliminated uh, 
about all of the apostles. And yet today I see more than when I started preaching years ago. This attitude that there's not a degree at the end of your name or at least a certificate from a preacher training school somewhere that everybody accepts as a good one. Now you haven't got a lot of chance of being a preacher. And that's a shame. That's very much of a shame. It doesn't mean you don't want people who are educated. Well, education is something that's very important. And especially when we talk about the Bible. But there's been a many a person who's educated himself and studied the Bible. In fact, I remember Brother Guy Wood saying after, well, he was talking about actually his two years at Freed Hardeman back in the 1920s. He said, that laid the groundwork for me and the fundamentals for me, but he said, I made a preacher in my own study. And I guarantee you if there's an effective preacher anywhere around, he knows that whatever education he had formerly, that he really came into his own of his own personal study and conviction and knowing that he needed to do so. You know, they didn't own a building at all in the first century. They just didn't. It wasn't there. But the cause of Christ flourished without their own building. Well, of course you have to have a place to assemble. And we do have a record of them assembling on the third floor. We have a record of them early on assembling in the porch of the temple. Places like that. But thinking about what we have here, uh, while others may have a whole lot more in the way of material beauty and so forth, they didn't have anything like that. They were run out of town. You look at the things that Paul wrote happened to him. Think about it as if it were put in a resume of a preacher looking to fill a position in a church. And think about what most elders nowadays would think if they read all those perils Paul was through and the prisons he had been in. They wouldn't touch him with a thousand-foot pole as far as being their preacher. They'll talk about how great he was, how faithful he was, how sacrificial he was, all he underwent in the way of persecution for the cause of Christ. But they wouldn't have a person like that as their preacher. They were humble fishermen as far as their efforts. They were tax collectors as far as the leaders were concerned. 1 Corinthians 1, 3, chapter 4, and verse 9. In fact, Paul says the apostles are considered fools and off scouring of the earth by the ordinary people. And then they had that marvelous, wonderful, very merciful imperial Roman government. If you wanted to see how a government could really treat people and care nothing for life, just study some Roman history about how they treated people. It was during this harsh rule of the Roman Caesars, God said, that's the right time for Christ to come into the world, Galatians 4.4. 4. That's the right time to establish my church. Because it proved the power of the gospel could overthrow all those pagan things and all of that kind of situation through godly living and no compromise of the truth. And of course, that opposition from the Caesars really mounted as the church grew and it left the confines of the Jews and spread among the Gentiles. And you know, they had everything but peace. Now, I'm glad to hear, brethren, and I do myself, pray for peace. Peace that we can spread the gospel, peace in e economics, peace in this nation, etc., etc. Read the book of Acts and just notice they didn't have that. They couldn't pray this. We're thankful we're gathered here without fear of molestation. I be a little light on this. I don't some people could lead a public prayer if they couldn't have that in there. Well, is that making light of the freedoms? No. I hope and pray that God in his providence allows this constitutional republic to continue with all the rights and privileges of it. But that doesn't mean it's going to. I don't know the mind of God anymore than anybody else. And I have to say at the end of every prayer, not my will, but thine be done. Because I do not know in his providential workings what might happen. It might be if the truth is going to continue that things get a whole lot worse in this nation to turn people around. I hear prayers all the time here. and They're right and I say amen to them. That we pray that the country uh, stay 
in harmony with the Constitution, that moral values, people will turn back to them. But sometimes we don't realize what we have to go through before that can happen. And that may not be pleasant at all. As to good weather, as I said, an opportune time, this didn't seem to be of any consequence, and I won't go into all of that in view of what I've said, other than I ask you when you read the book of Acts, you notice what all they went through. Just notice Paul's trip to Rome. And notice the list of perils. And one of the things that chills me to the bone is when he says, a night and a day in the deep. Now think about that for a minute. And he got into that fix because he loved the souls of men and was taking the gospel to others. A night and a day in the deep. And then all the beatings that he took because he loved the souls of men. He loved the Lord. And so on and so forth. He also tells the young preacher Timothy, endure hardness, a good soldier of the cross. Well, in this me, me, me generation and oh, you offend me stuff, that didn't exist among the faithful of the church at this time. Just because a, a tick bit you in between the toe, you didn't give up. You didn't holler, oh me, oh my, what am I going to do? A bug bit me. You didn't do that. You kept on doing what you knew was right regardless of the pain and anguish and privation. They didn't have prospects as we think of it. They didn't have conveniences as we think of it. When is, when is the last time you've been around a church building that did not have a man-made baptistry? I dare say for most of us been a while. Or as I said earlier, the building heated and cooled and ready for us. Most of us I'm afraid, get the idea that, well, I come, enjoy those things, and I leave. I never open the door. I never make sure that thermostats are sat. Well, we don't even know who does that. And this is a small congregation. We don't know who takes care of those things. They're just there, and I come and enjoy them, and I leave. Well, they didn't have any of that then. No clothing for the candidates for baptism. In fact, that wasn't that long ago. I've still got pictures of where people were going out into all sorts of bodies of water, and they were in their clothes. Sometimes they were close enough to a house to go change clothes. A lot of times in the clothes they wore to worship. You'll see them standing there in their white shirt, at least taking a towel, but they were baptized. I remember one time in Hampton, Arkansas, 50 years ago nearly, that the baptistry went had a big leak in it, so it wasn't working. And we went out to one of the deacon's farms because he had had gravel dug and there was a big gravel pit there. And it was shallow enough to get out into without stepping in some hole. It was clean enough so you might not get bit. It had gravel on the bottom so the water was really clear. And right in the middle of me baptizing a person, one of the prettiest basses flamped right behind me. <laughs> Uh, you haven't had experiences, and you can do a few of those things. Of course, then there was Russia, and you had those big big bathtubs like you saw 100 years ago here, and then you baptized somebody in that. Then there was a lady wanting to be baptized in Muskogee who had bad lung problems, and we got her at the burn tank and led her all the way down in that burn tank where they debreed the skin from burns until just her head sticking up and the nurse sat there and took off the oxygen mask and under she went and up, towel went across her face, oxygen mask back on, and she was baptized. Well, that has to do with the ordinary way we do things. It just helps us remember that the ordinary has not always been ordinary. Philippian jailer, ruler of the synagogue, the wicked Corinthians, Saul of Tarsus himself. Would you consider those folks as good prospects for a Bible study and possible conversion? I don't think we are as successful as, as they were with all of the modern conveniences we have of getting the truth out. And there's a reason for that. It still takes individual effort on every member of the church to go out and do it. Whether it's uh, do something over the internet, whether it's to write an article, you still have to convey the message. All of these other things are just helps. They're aids to get the thing out. 
And we're real good at talking about all the wonderful ways it can be done. But we're not too good at putting them into practice. I think to a great extent the church a long time ago started being too concerned about popularity. And yet Luke 6, 26, our Lord said, Woe when all men shall speak well of you. There will come times when a very distinct choice must be made for God and godly things and against men and the ways of this world. Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Too often in our haste to gain a place up high in the ladder of religious groups, we've developed far too many public relations people and all too few fearless teachers of the gospel and preachers of the word of God. You don't see people willing to debate anything anymore because they don't have the courage of their convictions. People pay little attention, preachers included, if error is exposed. It's just sort of like, well, it's been done. Let's go on like nothing ever happened. And that's been going on for years, virtually all my preaching career. We probably, in fact, I won't say probably, we don't have prayers like you read of in the Bible coming from the hearts of people totally dependent upon God, realizing that they have nothing without God, no matter their talents, that even came from God. Their bodies came from God. Everything came from God. It doesn't make any difference. It all comes from God. How are we using it in service to Him to save souls? And then somebody somewhere convinced us that the cheapest way is the best way. And we're convinced without very much effort on the part of the convincers. Radio, television, what used to be called, well, we call them home Bible studies now, cottage meetings, that was a popular term back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, billboard signs, all sorts of efforts to get to people. We're still not doing what they did in the first century church. Part of the reason is we're still afraid to say something that gets everybody mad at us. Do you realize that's getting harder and harder to do? Just stand up publicly somewhere and say, I believe that God exists, and see where that's going to get you. Now, you really want to get some miles rolled at you? Just say, Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Savior of the world, and there is no other. And then see what happens today. Then point out the only book there is on this earth revealing God's will to us as to how we're to be saved and go to heaven is the Bible. And no other book does it. Then see what happens. Or you begin to talk about the morality. And the only morality there is is that which is taught in the Bible that's acceptable to God. And then see what happens in homosexuals and the transvestites and the trans whatevers. And you'll see that it gets smaller and smaller is trying to say things that won't upset anybody. Until finally we're going to be crawling down where we, you know, can I even say I'm a Christian? I promise you somewhere, some places now, if you were to say, I'm a Christian, you're going to get into it. You're going to be in trouble. And it just keeps squeezing us and squeezing us, and we keep being squeezed. We are afraid to say some of the things that were openly said 20 and 30 years ago or less. We're afraid people will get after us. We are, and it's growing. That fear is not being set aside. It's growing. Why? You don't see it in the lives of the faithful people of the Lord's church that are recorded in the Bible. I don't know what the early church has done with the tools that we have. I really don't. But if they kept their conviction and faith and their courage it would have been amazing what they would have done today. I guess it just comes down to this for the church in general. We're just not as close to heaven as those people were because we don't have the faith they had that's as active as theirs was. Those early saints pressed closer to glory with each passing day, and this world just was not their home. They understood that here's the place to get ready for your home, and we use it as that or we fail it. Romans 13, 11, Philippians 1, 20 through 23, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. So I guess in closing, the best thing I can say after all of this is very general, is that no wonder the Word of God grew and multiplied at that day and time. 
because every member was aware of eternity and how brief life was and that what time they had on this earth was to be used in saving themselves and them that heard them, as Paul said to Timothy about staying with the doctrine. So while life appears for a vapor and then as a vapor and then vanishes after a little while, where are we in the vanishing of the vapor? I wonder if that'd make an article. Where are we? And let's make it more personal. In the vanishing of my vapor, my life. What are we doing? Where's our focus? Where's our dedication? Is it still too much in the here and now and on the level of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life? How much interest do we have in the church being strong and what it takes for it to be strong? And that means each one of us being strong and what it takes for us to be spiritually strong. Well, if you're not a Christian, there's no way you're going to go to heaven unless you're a Christian like Paul was a Christian like Peter was a Christian, like Timothy was a Christian, as that term is used and defined in the New Testament. Members of the church Jesus built, Matthew 16, 18, and that he began in Acts chapter 2. If you obey the gospel, the power of God to save, by believing in Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in him, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, the Lord will add you to the exact same church he added those people to on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. And it's in that exact same church that you will serve him faithfully in studying and getting ready for heaven. That's really all life's all about, getting ready for heaven. Everything else just is periphery. That's what life's about. So if you're a child of God and you let these things hinder you rather than help you as to the modern things of our age, uh, would you repent of those things and be determined to individually and personally strive to study your Bible, engage in prayer, and use your opportunities to try to spread the gospel to other people. If you haven't done so, please repent of those sins. Confess them to God and pray that he'll forgive you. I'm glad to tell you, if you do what God said to become a Christian, you will, and he'll forgive you of your sins, and he'll hold them against you no more. If as a child of God you sin, and you repent of them, and confess them, and pray for forgiveness, as surely as I stand here, he will forgive your sins, and you'll stand before him justified. Brethren, that's where we all want to be, covered by the blood of Christ because of our love for the truth and obedience to the same. So if you're subject to the good invitation of our Lord, please heed that invitation while we stand and sing.